Hey everybody, Dr. Wolder here for Integrated Medicine Academy. This is Great Plains Laboratory, complimentary monthly webinar that I provide. And I thought we would, in this webinar, go through some markers on the organic acid test that are not commonly seen. So they, they don't come up that often. And, and uh, so I thought it might be an interesting discussion to kind of go through a few of those. We're not going to go through every single marker on the organic acid test, otherwise we'd, we'd be here all day. Uh, but there's, uh, there's enough other markers that can be indicative of certain problems that are worth noting. And some of these you may have already seen in your practice or maybe heard me talk in some other webinars that I've done. On for some of the for some of these maybe this is you know brand new information. So this particular talk is, uh, although I wouldn't call it an advanced discussion on organic acid testing, it's it's definitely not a beginner talk. It's uh, almost kind of assuming you've at least seen some of my information before, whether it was some of my online courses or webinars through Great Plains where we've looked at different aspects of the organic acid test, or perhaps you've seen Dr. Shaw talk or Great talk. Uh, but either way, I think it'll be useful for you. So the organic acid test is a critical test. It's a test that I commonly run in my practice. I always view the OAT test as a foundational test to perform kind of the, that the, you know, the hub of the wheel, so to speak. It's, it's where everything can build from. Um, it's one of the first tests I learned how to use from Great Plains over 20 years ago, and I still use it today. And uh, you know, some of you know that I actually teach a one-day intensive seminar on the incorporation of the organic acid test in practice. It's a lot of markers on this test are worth knowing. Not every one you have to memorize. Okay, so it's impossible to memorize every single marker. And there's ones that you see more commonly, and there's ones that show up from time to time. If you go to Great Plains' website and you go under the test section where you can learn more about each test, go into the organic acid test page and you can access an online clinical significance of the organic acid test, test interpretation booklet. It's worth having that easily accessible to you, whether you grab something as a PDF and you hold on your desktop computer, print it out, or just accept, access it off of their website. You can always bookmark the page because every once in a while you'll come upon a marker where you go, geez, I've never seen that before, or it's been a while since I've seen that. What what does it mean? And that's where you can go reference this material. Now, what is the oat? Right. Some of these slides actually come from the one day intensive seminar I do. Uh, and one of the first things we start with is, well, what exactly is the organic acid test? Well, it's a very comprehensive test that gives us insight metabolically into different imbalances that can occur in the body and give us some indicators of underlying chronic illness. I was reading something the other day where it's estimated that 40% of the metabolites, chemical metabolites that are flowing through our bloodstream on a daily basis actually come from the digestive system. And the vast majority of them come from the bacteria and the other organisms that live in our digestive system microbiome. I thought that was a, an amazing statistic. So the oat gives us some insight into our own metabolic imbalances, as well as imbalances that could be occurring in the digestive system. And these organic acids are these compounds that carry acidic properties. So alcohol or carboxyl or thiol type chemical groups are categorized as organic acids. But it's always important to apply the test clinically to your patient, right? It's not about number crunching or trying to come up with 43 different supplements based on 43 different abnormal markers. You still have to learn how to apply the information clinically and try to determine what is most relevant. Because many times these lesser known markers on the organic acid appear 
and they can appear because of other imbalances that might occur. So the presence of yeast or fungal markers sometimes can influence mitochondria markers or affect the amino acid metabolites. Same thing with the bacterial markers or even the clostridium markers. Oxalate metabolites, which is found on page two of the test, certainly has a lot of clinical significance for people with chronic pain, fibromyalgia-like pain, tender point pain, um, joint pain, kidney stones, obviously, urinary discomfort, behavioral issues in, in, in kids sometimes when their oxalates are high. The glycolytic and mitochondrial markers are linked to cellular metabolism, linked to mitochondrial function. Now, the mitochondria, being the energy factories of the cells, can be compromised because of multiple factors. Nutritional deficiencies can compromise mitochondrial function, oxidative stress, inflammation, but also yeast and fungal issues, bacterial problems, oxalate issues, chemicals, heavy metals, mycotoxins, etc. The O test has sections for neurotransmitter assessment. Okay, this isn't specifically just what's happening in the brain, it's, it's ha it, but it's, these are reactions that are happening within the nervous system throughout the body. And we can look at things like dopamine metabolism, dopamine excess, for example, is often present when clostridia, bacteria is present. I'll show you where that links up here shortly. Tryptophan being linked to serotonin can be imbalanced Serotonin deficiencies are common in depression and anxiety, sleep disorders, et cetera. And there's another chemical we wanna pay attention to called quinolinic acid, which in an elevated state can be a chemical toxin, if you will, that's stressful to the brain or nervous system. We can get insight into certain, what are called pyrimidines that are linked to folate metabolism and, and um, that's important for methylation ketone fatty acid oxidation and it's using some insight into how well the cell is metabolizing fat nutritional markers deficiencies in b6 and vitamin c are quite common some of the lesser known markers of indicate coq10 or b12 deficiency are important to recognize as well there's a section for detoxification indication. Okay, this isn't not, this isn't an end-all be-all test for everything related to detox or detoxification system, but when you have imbalances in this section, it certainly shows you that the ability to detox detoxify might be compromised. Okay, and then there's a section called amino acid metabolites, probably the oldest part of any organic acid test. Many of the markers are linked to what are called inborn errors of metabolism seen in children. This section is often influenced because of other imbalances in the body, whether that's bacterial problems, yeast issues, et cetera. So let's look at a few things re related to yeast and fungal markers. <clears throat> now, you probably heard me in the past talk a lot about arabinose linked to invasive candida or tartaric acid many times being linked to invasive candida. So I'm going to skip that for now because I've talked about that in other webinars. Let's focus on these three things, two, four, and nine. Okay, two and four are specific for mold exposure, mold essentially colonizing the gut. So particularly aspergillus mold. And then number nine is called tricarboxylic, which is linked to a fungus found in corn. Marker number two, okay, this, this 5 hydroxy 2 furoric chemical comes from aspergillus mold. Aspergillus is a common mold in the environment. It can be acquired both through food as well as water damaged buildings or building material. Um, when you see an elevation of number two on the organic acid test, it doesn't tell you where the source is, but it, what it does tell you is that aspergillus is colonizing the gut, meaning it's growing in the digestive system. Number four is the same, 2,5-furan decarboxylic acid. In my experience, number two tends to show up a little more commonly than number four, but most of the time when there is mold growing in the gut, two and four are present, but you know, you could, you might say that you might see number two 
slightly more prevalent than number four, okay? Um, fortunately, this is, these are not common markers on the organic acid test. Vast majority of the oats tests that I see don't have these markers present, but when they do show up, it is significant and does indicate mold exposure. Now, aspergillus produces a specific type of mycotoxin called aflatoxin M1. Aflatoxin M1 is a carcinogen. It actually inhibits a protein called P53, which is a tumor suppressor. Most of these mycotoxins produced by mold are not only damaging to the kidneys, but they're also damaging to the liver. So the image you see here below under the mycotox profile, this is the mycotox test from Great Plains. Uh, it's a very worthwhile test to do. It's one of the newer profiles that's come out this year. I'm highly recommended to do because you can't solely rely on the organic acid test information to tell you whether or not you or your patient has mycotoxin levels. There are plenty of scenarios where the markers two and four on the organic acid test are normal, but the mycotoxins are still elevated. So you really need to test. When markers number two are elevated though on the organic acid test, what at least you know what's happening is that person has mold exposure, they likely have elevated mycotoxins, you need to test for it, but that you also know they have mold growing in the gut. And that always causes dysfunction because it can um, suppress immune function in the gut, which increases the susceptibility to other pathogens like Clostridia bacteria or invasive Candida. Ocrotoxin A is often seen in association with aflatoxin. This can come from a penicillium, uh, mold as well as aspergillus. It's damaging to the kidneys, it's, it's immune toxic. Uh, ochratoxin and aflatoxin found together basically enhances the toxicity of each. Ochratoxin A is also known to suppress the immune system in the gut too. So in the presence of ochratoxin, there's usually increased susceptibility to invasive candida or pathogenic bacteria. Marker number nine is called tricarboxylic. Tricarboxylic is a, um, it's a chemical produced by a fungal toxin, or excuse me, a fungus that is generally found in corn and corn-based food products. That doesn't mean every time you eat corn, you're coming in contact with it, but usually I find this elevated people who consume a lot of corn and corn products. So sometimes it's just shifting diet and that many times is enough to sometimes have this marker normalized. Um, so a couple things to consider. Again, you know, these are sort of lesser seen or lesser known markers on the organic acid test under the yeast and fungal section. Let's go to the bacterial marker section. So 11, 12, and 13 are fairly common. Okay, they don't all show up the same time, but basically 11, 12, 13 are generally seen with just dysbiosis, bacterial imbalance in the digestive system, typically coming from the large intestine, although it is possible you can also have an overgrowth of normal intestinal bacteria in the small bowel that's linked to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that these markers might be suggestive of. But in my opinion, you still need to do the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth testing, the hydrogen and methane testing to absolutely confirm what's called SIBO. Um, these two markers we have arrows to, hyperic and DHPPA, um, are often confused. People get to be assumed that they're related to some kind of pathogen. DHPPA is a marker indicative of act beneficial bacteria activity in the gut. It can, it can be produced by bifidobacter, E. coli, lactobacillus, normal bacteria in the gut. There is a clostridia bacteria that produces it, but it's usually found at a very, very low percentage. Turns out that DHPPA actually is an antioxidant and has been shown to lower cholesterol. So it actually uh, looks like it has some beneficial roles in the gut 
as opposed to being a marker of an infection. Hyperic, marker number 10, this too can come about from normal intestinal bacterial activity. It might be indicative of something called toluene. Toluene is a solvent. So if somebody it works around solvents, chemicals, for example, then you know that might be the source. But more commonly for most people, this is a normal marker of intestinal bacteria. There's a chemical that we obtain through various types of foods like coffee and carrots, blueberries, potatoes, apples, et cetera, called chlorogenic acid that certain bacteria will use and convert it to hyperic acid. Okay, so again, it, in most circumstances, I think you're, what you're looking at is normal bacterial activity. What about the clostridium markers? Well, in previous lectures, I've gone over extensively information about markers 16 and 17, HP, HPA, and 4-creosol. Not much gets said about number 15, 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid, and even less gets mentioned about the other marker, 3 indolacetic acid. And the main reason is, is these really aren't seen all that commonly, okay? Particularly the 3 indolacetic acid, that's something that's, I don't see very often at all. The vast majority of times when I see elevated clostridium markers on the oat, it's either 16 or 17. In fact, the, the rough estimates are about one in four organic acid tests have an elevated clostridium marker. About 80% of the time, it's the HPHPA that's high. About 15% approximately is the 4-creosol. Around 5% or less is the 4-hydroxyphenylacetic. Again, I don't see 3-endolacetic acid very much at all. So the lesser seen, lesser known markers on the clostridia section would be number 15 and 16. We know that these clostridia markers, specifically for creosol and HPHPA, through their chemical structure, can inhibit an enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase. So, dopamine beta hydroxylase is what converts dopamine to norepinephrine in the nervous system. When that enzyme is inhibited, you can get an elevation of dopamine. Dopamine elevated beyond its normal level breaks down into different toxic compounds and is stressful to the brain and nervous system. So it's known that HPHPA and creosol can do it. It's suspect that even something like 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid will likely inhibit that enzyme too. Okay, but again, it's not as commonly seen as the other two. <clears throat> this particular bacteria, excuse, marker or chemical is produced by C. difficile, but it's also produced by other clostridia as well. There's some suspicion that it might be a marker of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth due to clostridia bacteria. It's likely an inhibitor of that dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme, so it's likely that it too will or could increase dopamine levels. There has been associations with 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid elevations in celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, even certain parasite infections like Giardia. So at some point, if that is a clinical suspicion, doing a stool test to rule out for parasites could be worthwhile. Three endolacetic acid. This is the one that you very rarely see, at least in experience. It does come about from different types of clostridia bacteria. Now, very high amounts of this metabolite could be from a depletion of tryptophan, okay? So there's always that possibility. Um, a, a, a deficiency of tryptophan can lead to a deficiency of serotonin, but also a deficiency of tryptophan could also lead to very low levels of something called quinolinic acid, which I'll point out here shortly. But again, this is not a marker 
that you will see all that commonly. All right, page two of the oat, okay, top section, oxalates. I've talked a lot about oxalic acid oxalate issues in other lectures. We know that it's a contributing factor to kidney stones. Some of the lesser seen, lesser known markers on this test are the glycolic and the glyceric. Most, most of the time when a oxalate section has some elevation, it's just oxalate itself commonly linked to excessive consumption of high oxalate foods. Candida, as well as other yeast, even mold, can also produce oxalates, or at least contribute to the oxalate value. There are different types of genetic imbalances that can contribute as well. Even a B6 deficiency could be a contributing factor too, is what this entire slide is getting at. There are certain disorders, what are called primary hyperoxaluria, is the genetic disorders that lead to significantly elevated oxalates. But you don't necessarily have to have the genetic disease in order to have some elevation of some of these other oxalate values high. Okay, it doesn't mean that there's life-threatening illness occurring if the level is elevated, but they are linked to some type of defect in these converting enzymes. Okay, some people have very, very severe defects, others have minor. Type one hypooxaluria is caused by a deficiency of an enzyme called alanine glyoxalate immunotransferase. It, now this enzyme is dependent on B6. So a B6 deficiency could contribute to a weakness in the function of this enzyme. Typically what's seen is a high oxalate value or I should say oxalic acid or oxalic on the O test, but um, oxalate, oxalic, they're just a different chemical conversion of the same compound. And you will also see an elevated gly glycolytic on the O2. Now, one other thing is it's possible to have elevation of glycolytic because of yeast. So we can't entirely say it's all necessarily due to a defect, it could be a yeast component. You have to kind of backtrack and look at the yeast section too. Either way, okay, it's important to regulate diet, to be sick for, for high oxalates, you know, et cetera. We've talked about that in, in other webinars. Type two hypooxaluria, okay, is a defect in this glyoxalate reductase hydroxypyruvate reductase enzyme. Now, in a severe situation, that could end up leading to major problems with kidney stones and even end-stage kidney failure. What is typically seen, though, on the organic acid test is an elevation of glyceric. Again, just because there's a high glyceric on the test doesn't mean that somebody has a genetic disease. Okay, but it does show that there's at least some weakness in that enzyme, okay, maybe even just, you know, a, a little bit that's compromising the function of oxalate metabolism. Of the two, between glycolic and glyceric, you're going to see glycolic much more often. So about 80% of the time when I look at an organic acid test, all that's elevated is the oxalic marker. When there's an elevation of glycolic or glyceric, about 80% of the time, it's the glycolic that's high. Glyceric tends to show up much less commonly. Let's go down to the glycolytic cycle metabolites. Okay, this is the first section that starts to look at cellular function, energy production linked to mitochondrial activity. Lactic and pyruvic are linked to the glycolytic cycle. So this is linked to glucose metabolism. Elevations of lactic can come from a wide variety of things. People who are, you know, exercise vigorously, um, you know, who have a lot of physical stress might have elevations of lactic acid. It can come about from bacterial overgrowth of the GI tract. So you have to correlate that back, right? Is there some are there elevations of GI bacteria? If not, then you're not probably dealing with an overgrowth situation that's triggering elevated lactic. B vitamin deficiencies, anemia could contribute to it, mitochondrial damage as well, 
Another thing to watch out for is mycotoxin exposure. I'll show you a slide later where that research comes into play. Elevations of pyruvic are elevated for much of the same reasons that cause elevations of lactic. Another thing which I didn't list here that can sometimes be seen with elevations of lactic and pyruvic is very high oxalic markers. Although that's not a correlation I see every single time. I see plenty of people who have high oxalate levels and their lactic and pyruvic levels are totally normal. Okay, so that's not a, an automatic guarantee that that's, that's gonna be the case. What Great Plains has done in analyzing certain markers on the organic acid test being linked to uh, mold or mycotoxins, they find a very strong correlation between something like aflatoxin, which comes from aspergillus mold, showing high levels of lactic acid. Okay, so that's certainly one thing to watch out for. You'll see here the 5 hydroxy methyl 2 furoric and the furan 2 5 decarboxylic Well, those are markers two and four on the first page of the oat. We already know it indicates some colonization of mold in the gut. You might see an elevation of pyroglutamic. Pyroglutamic is the marker in the indicators of detoxification section that's linked to a glutathione deficiency. But the lactic acid could be an indicator of that, okay? So a, a good idea to correlate the mycotox test as well with the oat. Now, what about the mitochondrial markers, the Krebs cell metabolites? I've talked a lot in the past about succinic. In fact, the toxicity mastery course that I have through our online academy is we go through the, the organic acid test a lot, go through the GPL tox test significantly uh, or real comprehensively, even going through the mycotox test as well to see how things correlate to these mitochondrial sections. It's not uncommon to see elevations of succinic in the presence of chemical and heavy metal toxins. Some of these other markers that you see like fumaric and malic, for example, can come about because of yeast and fungal overgrowth. So succinic has a very strong correlation to chemical exposure as well as heavy metals. Fumaric and malic, again, these things are sometimes elevated in the presence of invasive candida. Citric acid is interesting. That's part of that one section. It can be high just from eating citric acid foods, but yeast can also produce citric acid. So you got to look back and correlate that with previous information on page one of the oat. A glutathione deficiency can also increase citric acid levels. But if you've got elevated citric acid and your pyroglutamic levels are normal, it's not likely that a glutathione deficiency is what's causing the high citric acid. Acatenic acid, another marker that will sometimes show up under the Krebs cycle section, can actually be linked to a glutathione deficiency. It can also indicate what's called a complex one mitochondrial dysfunction. And when we look at the mitochondria, it's made up of two, two membranes. We've got an outer membrane and an inner membrane. In the middle of the inner membrane is this area called the matrix where a lot of the metabolic activity goes on. The citric acid cycle is also called our Krebs cycle. So it's sort of that first, first area where we're starting to produce certain energy substrate. And then things get transferred to this inner mitochondrial membrane and these complexes here, one, two, three, four, are linked to something called the electron transport chain. And that's the area where we really produce a wide variety, excuse me, really produce a large amount of ATP, that cellular energy currency that we need to run our body. This is an extended view of that inner mitochondrial membrane. Complex one is right here. It's very much linked to the presence of CoQ10. So a CoQ10 deficiency could also compromise 
the first position of the electron transport chain. Think of this like a uh, like a, a factory line producing something, producing a car, for example, right? We move from one step to the next step to the next step. Well, that's what we're doing. We're moving from position one to two to three to four to ultimately produce ATP. Succinic or succinate that you see here under complex two, when that is elevated on the organic acid test, which we know by the way, is often linked to chemical exposure, that's indicating that there's some kind of weakness in the complex two position of the electron transport chain. One thing to keep in mind though is that succinic is not only found within complex two, it's also found in the Krebs cycle as well. Either way, an elevation of succinic indicates mitochondrial dysfunction, but many of those other markers in those sections to indicate a dysfunction in the mitochondria. Same thing with the amino acid metabolites. Okay, so this is markers 31, excuse me, 30, 31, and 32. Most of the time these things are showing up, the levels are just slightly high. Okay, so it indicates the dysfunction, but you're not, it doesn't define a disease process, but definitely indicates some kind of dysfunction, usually being influenced by something else, yeast, bacteria, chemicals, heavy metals, molds, for example. In this particular example, we've got number 31, for example, 3-hydroxybutyric. Again, the level is just mildly high. This certainly indicates mitochondrial dysfunction, but in extreme cases, when these levels get extremely high, okay, there might be some kind of lysine metabolic disorder. Okay? Again, most of the time you're dealing with numbers that are fairly low. 30 and 32 could be linked to what's called a leucine amino acid deficiency. Again, typically the levels in most cases are fairly low. So we're dealing with just a mitochondrial dysfunction being triggered by something else. Let's go to the phenylalanine tyrosine metabolite section. Okay. This is an area that is often influenced by Clostridia bacteria toxins whether it's the 4-creosol, the HPHBA, or the 4-hydroxyphenylacetic acid. We know that those chemicals coming from clostridia can inhibit that dopamine converting enzyme, which could cause dopamine levels to rise. When we get an elevation of dopamine, there's a spillover effect seen with, a, with a elevated levels of homovanillic acid or HVA. Okay, so in this particular case, we can see the HVA is high, the one thing we, when you look and you find HVA high, look back under the clostridia section to see if any of those clostridia markers are elevated. If they are, that's likely why the dopamine is high. If they're not, then you're likely dealing with somebody who has a genetic defect in the dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme. And from my understanding, Great Plains will be coming out with a specific test to evaluate the dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme. Uh, I'm not sure when, but that, that is in the works of happening. It is possible that you could have somebody who has an enzyme defect and on top of it has a clostridia problem. Okay, you have to test for both, but that scenario could exist. Under the tryptophan metabolites, it's not uncommon to see low normal levels of the 5 hydroxy acetic acid linked to serotonin and a elevation of the quinolinic 5 hydroxy acetic acid ratio. Okay, that's, that's um, very, very common um, scenario. A less common situation is where you have elevation of the quinolinic acid all by itself. Okay, so this again is not well known and it's not as commonly seen as some of the other scenarios I've mentioned here. Why that's significant with high quinolinic acid is high quinolinic acid in an elevated state is stressful and toxic to the brain and nervous system. 
stress in general, okay, increased levels of cortisol or the presence of chronic infections, whether it's a viral infection, a fungal infection, a bacterial infection, it could also be the trigger for high quinolinic acid itself because those stressors activate an enzyme called IDO and IDO takes tryptophan and it converts it into quinolinic acid. So when you find an elevated level of quinolinic acid, you wanna start looking back and saying, okay, does this person have a, a yeast issue? Do they have a bacterial problem? What kind of life stressors are happening in their life? Um, is there possibly a viral infection? What else could be going on that could be causing the immune system to be hyperactive that's triggering the quinolinic acid levels to be elevated? One other thing to keep in mind too, and this often gets overlooked, is right here, phthalate. Phthalate is a chemical that's measurable off of the Great Plains Laboratory in, in um, GPL tox test, the chemical toxin profile. In the presence of elevated phthalate, the phthalate could inhibit this specific enzyme, this converting enzyme of quinolinic acid. If that enzyme becomes inhibited, the, that could end up causing quinolinic acid to elevate too. So there could be a direct link between phthalate and high quinolinic acid. How would you know? You'd have to do the GPL tox test as well, okay? You're not gonna know that just looking at the organic acid test. Quinolinic acid is what's called an MDA receptor agonist. It's a potent neurotoxin. It's often elevated in very serious neurodegenerative conditions, diseases, as well as certain psychiatric disorders as well. It's even been linked to suicidal ideation in extreme cases. What ends up happening is the quinolinic acid can trigger what are called NMDA receptors in the brain and nervous system that causes a flood of chemical reactions inside the cells that overwhelm the cell's defenses. We get increased oxidative stress. Increased oxidative stress usually leads to damage within the cellular membranes of the body that then can cause damage of the external cell membranes, the mitochondrial cell membranes, as well as damage the DNA, okay? And all of that has an adverse effect on the nervous system in the brain as well. When you get prolonged activation of this, there are neurodegenerative consequences. This has been linked, this mechanism has been linked to Alzheimer's disease, for example. It's also being shown to, to have a link to treatment resistant depression, even suicidal behavior in people. So the organic acid test is a, a critical test to implement for a wide variety of, of people you may be dealing with. It's not just for autistic kids, it's not just for the elderly, it's for everybody in between um, who's dealing with either some kind of chronic mental health problem, physical pain problem, digestive problem, chronic fatigue, a whole host of things. The pyrimidine metabolite section looks at folate metabolism now this is, could be used in a much broader discussion with regards to the whole methylation cycle, but let's just keep it simple. The folate cycle is linked to the methylation cycle. We don't get good effects of methylation if we don't have good effects of folate and vice versa. Um, we need an active folate system in order to make sure that we have an active, well-functioning methylation system. Methylation is involved in detox, awareness, cognitive abilities, language abilities, um, et cetera. The, the story of the markers on the organic acid test that you're seeing, the thymine and the uracil, have their link back to, at the level of DNA and RNA, okay? Now, DNA is a, is a double-stranded, what's called this double helix, where you get these polynucleotide um, 
chains essentially that wrap around each other and we get these these four base pair nucleotides that link up so adenine links to thymine cytosine links to guanine and that's what makes a base pair and that's what carries the genetic information rna what's called ribonucleic acid are single strands and there's different types of rna there's messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA. These things are involved in forming proteins within the cell, okay? And we need proteins that are there to support the cardiovascular system, support the brain and nervous system, support the immune system, for example. So this is a very active process and RNA activity can be increased based on increased need and demand in the body, you know, to keep up. Okay, so there's a lot of movement and activity happening in this system. Uracil is linked to RNA. Thymine is linked to DNA. So you'll notice on the organic acid test, you've got uracil and thymine. When there is an elevation, it indicates that there's likely some problem happening within the folate system because folate is linked to the proper formation and function of this pyrimidines uh, system, if you will. In most cases that I've seen with the organic acid test, and again, I'm gonna go back to that 80%, about 80% of the time in general, the pyrimidine section is normal, okay? Um, when there is an elevation, almost 90% of the time, it's the uracil that's high. And it's likely because uracil is linked to RNA and there's just a lot of increased activity in that RNA system because of increased demand for protein formation in the body. Okay, thymine elevations are seen much less than the uracil. Um, so just keep that in mind. You're gonna if if the section shows a positive, it's gonna usually be the uracil that's high. And basically, what you're dealing with is dealing with some kind of folate imbalance. Okay, it doesn't tell us if it's some you know MTHFR problem or if it's a deficiency. It just shows you that there's some kind of you know need for additional folate. The ketone fatty acid oxidation section. Most time, what you get is some mild elevations of these specific markers. Severe elevations might indicate, you know, some type of metabolic disease process. Um, but again, in, in, a, in a typical practice setting, most of the time you're looking at low level elevations that are either linked to a digestive problem, malabsorption, yeast overgrowth, um, bacterial overgrowth in the gut that's causing some kind of dysfunction in fat metabolism. Minimally, what's being used is just some L-carnitine supplementation to help the cells process fat better because we need fat as a primary fuel source for high-end ATP production within the mitochondria. So in this particular example, uh, number 41 and 42 being elevated, sometimes those two markers can be high because of a candida overgrowth or a bacterial overgrowth in the gut. You always got to correlate this information back to the overall health status of somebody. You could be dealing with somebody who's a diabetic, for example, that's you know causing some of these problems or somebody else who has some, some other kind of chronic illness. This section can also be influenced by diet. So people who are doing a ketogenic diet you sometimes will see inflated numbers, okay? Because they're, they're consuming a lot of fat, more than normal. Um, and so that's just something that's recognizable. Certain supplements like medium chain triglyceride oil, for example, could inflate these numbers. And then there's a few things that show from time to time that are worth, worth noting, like elevations of a diptych, for example, that are just kind of mildly high. You know, many times seen with somebody who's consuming a lot of gelatin or junk food. Subaric elevations mildly high sometimes are linked 
to an overnight fast. This particular example that you're seeing in here is not of somebody who had a metabolic disorder. It was of somebody who was using MCT oil, medium train triglyceride oil, in an attempt to fight candida. Okay, so it was just inflating the numbers on the test. The nutritional marker section. I've talked a lot about this. I'm not going to go through every single marker here. Let's talk about ones that you typically won't see that are out of the ordinary or imbalanced. Primarily the ones that you don't commonly see are 50, 55, or 57. Now, on the, on the test, you'll notice that 50, 53, 55, and 57 have an asterisk next to them. The, the, why that is, is these are called indirect markers, meaning that when the marker is elevated, it indicates a need or additional need for that, that nutrient. 51, 52, 54, and 56 are more direct. Okay, so <clears throat> generally what you're looking at is when the levels are low is, in, is indicating a greater need for that nutrient. Don't see elevations of methylmalonic, at least I don't personally, all that often. When you have an elevation of marker 50 methylmalonic, it's indicating there's a need for additional vitamin B12. Okay, just pretty, pretty straightforward. An elevation of glutaric, I don't have an arrow there because it's actually fairly common to see that elevated, indicating a riboflavin or vitamin B2 need. That is commonly seen when candida is present. Just a, and most of the time the level is just slightly high, okay, 2.3, 2.4. I don't see elevations of the 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutaric all that often, the vitamin CoQ10. Okay, but if it's high, it's indicating a CoQ10 deficiency. Elevation of the methyl citric, again, not something that's seen that often. That indicates a biotin deficiency. Of the three that have arrows pointing to them, if I were to have a rough estimate of which one of those you might actually see elevated more commonly than others, it would probably go methylmalonic first, vitamin CoQ second, methyl citric third on, the, on, on that list as far as commonality. But as a general rule, they're not commonly abnormal. Indicators of detoxification. I've talked a lot in other webinars as well as my online courses about 58 and 59 linked to a glutathione deficiency. Um, number 61 gets a lot of press to hydroxyhyperic is, you know, commonly elevated, even low end, 1.5, 1.6, can be linked to GI bacteria or somebody who's consuming artificial colors or flavors. The one that doesn't get a lot of discussion often is number 60, ortic, which is linked to an excess production of ammonia. That purely could be coming about because of some kind of imbalance in the gut from bacteria. Okay, so if you've got elevated bacterial levels on the bacterial section, that might be what's causing it, or just protein maldigestion in general. Most of the time, the levels are pretty minimal. Um, I very rarely ever see levels of ortic above five. Okay, most of the time they're like this 1.1, 1 1.3, 2.3, somewhere around there. In severe cases, they can be linked to some type of inborn error of metabolism linked to urea or the urea cycle defects, which could cause problems with ammonia excess. Um, again, that's you know not all that common. So the, it's most of the ones you'll see are, are fairly common, you know, the elevated here, usually linked to some kind of bacterial overgrowth in the gut. The amino acid metabolites. Now there's a lot on this page and we, you know, this could take, this could be a three hour lecture to go through every little subtle nuance of every marker on this test. Fortunately, you know, good 80% of the time or more, these markers are normal. Low values have no known clinical significance. 
most of the time when the when there is a level that's high it's just slightly high okay we're not typically looking at levels that are in the hundreds of values that would be more in line with a true metabolic disease now the test is here the markers are here because this is typically one of the oldest sections of an organic acid test so it's important to have if a company is going to do an organic acid test because you know every once in a while you might find somebody who actually has a serious problem fortunately though in most most cases that's not that's not necessarily the case now you'll see an elevation here number 68 mandylic just slightly elevated Mandela can come about for a number of reasons. Um, one, of the, one of the common causes of elevated mandelic is styrene exposure, styrene being found in plastics. So one of the additional tests to do in that is the GPL tox test, which we talked about earlier, you might, you'll commonly find people actually have elevated levels of styrene. It also can be elevated in a situation of what's called PKU, phenyl, uh, phenylketonuria. And phenylketonuria is a disorder where individuals lack the ability to properly utilize phenylalanine. And phenylalanine, we know, is important for the nervous system, okay, because it's, um, you know, important in neurotransmitter function. Oftentimes, if there is some problem in the phenylalanine system, you will also see elevations of phenylactic as well as phenylpyruvic as well. If there is really a serious metabolic condition happening here, the levels are usually very high. Okay, so slight elevations that you see here could just be somebody who's dealing with some kind of mild defect in those enzymes but it's not a specific disease state for example but we can still have dysfunction in some of these enzymes that compromises function but it doesn't necessarily shut the whole system down for example So phenylalanine is important because phenylalanine is what gets converted into tyrosine. Tyrosine is important because it is a precursor to dopamine production. Tyrosine is also involved in thyroid production. If there is a block of the phenylalanine high, um, um, a converting enzyme, what ends up happening is we can start to see elevations of phenylpyruvate and on the organic acid test what's being measured is phenylactic or phenylactate and phenylacetate levels so a defect in phenylalanine causing a problem in tyrosine can create mental retardation in kids it can lead to seizures it can lead to even in severe cases microcephaly a lot of times what will smell is the urine will have a musty odor smell to it there also could be hypopigmentation okay light skin light hair blue eyes for example because we're getting a reduction in melanin production. There's a, there was a typo on the slide, it's not melatonin. Okay, so tyrosine is involved in a lot of things. It's involved in dopamine production, it's involved in melanin production, it's involved in thyroid production, et cetera. And so a block in that phenylalanine converting enzyme could lead to elevated phenylalanine, decreased tyrosine, and then metabolic spillover effects. A couple other markers that are lesser seen, lesser known on the organic acid test are things like number 62 and 66. Okay, again, most of the time these levels when they do show up are fairly low. They're not extremely high. And in most cases, like we're seeing here, 62, 66, you're dealing with somebody who's thiamine deficient. Okay, vitamin B1. 
In fact, this particular test came from somebody who, um, you know, and this can happen in people who consume a lot of alcohol, which tends to deplete nutrients in the body anyway. Marker 72, hydroxyphenolactic, is interesting because it can actually be linked to what's called tyrosinemia, which is a tyrosine um, metabolic imbalance. Again, in this particular case, the level is not extremely high. Some of these things could be linked back to just nutritional imbalances in the body because of poor lifestyle, poor diet, alcohol consumption, etc. But that could be a link too to tyrosine imbalance. That could be a link to thyroid problems or, or dopamine problems as well. So <clears throat> there's a lot more that could be discussed in this section. Fortunately, again, these are not commonly seen in most oats. And when they are elevated, the levels are usually fairly low and they often are improved just through improvements in diet, dealing with underlying yeast bacterial problems, improving gut function and using good overall supplementation like a multivitamin, mineral antioxidant, essential fatty acids. Okay, so that's the information for this webinar. I am currently in the process of creating an, what's called an, uh, an advanced oat mastery course. And this will be coming out in March of 2019. And it is going to be extensive. Um, very, very in-depth. It is highly recommended that people who take this course have some background already in oat testing, um, which I strongly recommend if you have not, if you're a practitioner and have not been to one of the Great Plains Laboratory oat seminars, that you go to one of those um, to get basic background in how to utilize the oat in practice. Also, those seminars now are incorporating information on glyphosate, chemical toxicity, mold toxicity, et cetera, which gets incorporated into any discussion you have when you start looking at the oat test in a much more in-depth level. And that's what this particular course is gonna be all about. It's, it's going way beyond the surface level of the oat and starting to really break it down and looking at, even in a more advanced way, some of these lesser known, uh, lesser seen markers. So <clears throat> more information about that um, later in the year, but if you wanna get some um, general information and get on the list for information coming out about that course, you can text advanced oat, all one word, advanced oat to 66866. Okay, again, so that course starts March 4th of 2019. It'll be online. Um, the organic acid test seminars, you know, have been going on now for about three years. I, I do an entire day on how to incorporate the organic acid test into practice. Make sure to go to Great Plains' website to look for upcoming oat seminars in your area. So, they generally happen about once every six weeks to eight weeks or so. Um, there are more opportunities happening now through the rest of 2018. I'm speaking in Canada, in Calgary. I'll be in Dallas in September. Also talking in San Diego as well in November. Um, so, and then there's more planned for 2019 as well. If you're an individual who would like access to the organic acid test, we have a website called Lab Test Plus, where we provide access to a lot of the Great Plains lab testing, including the organic acid test. And when a lab is ordered through this website, I actually sit down and do a written review of findings. So each lab test comes with a written review of the relevant lab markers. So you can go to labtestplus.com, look under the Great Plains link, and look at the different tests that are carried on Lab Test Plus. If you are a parent or caregiver of a loved one with autism, 
uh, I'm always available for ongoing questions through the Autism Recovery System website. This website actually has a forum. There's a section in there for private messaging to me as well that people utilize. There's a lot of other information on this site from, from videos to protocols to articles. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook as well at Autism Recovery System. The Autism Recovery System site, there is a biomedical course that was specifically designed for parents. It's over 10 hours of lectures and videos that are part of the website. So it's called Autism Recovery 101. Once you get into the Autism Recovery System site, you can just click on the link for Autism Recovery 101 and it'll take you to that section. If you practitioner um, who is interested in more in-depth training in integrative medicine, we have a number of different courses. We have something called SIBO Mastery, which is a nine module intensive course on SIBO and other digestive disorders that either cause or contribute to SIBO. So you can go to um, Integrative Medicine Academy and get access to the SIBO Mastery course. We have a Toxicity Mastery course, which is also nine modules go very in depth into chemical toxins, metal toxins, the oat test, the GPL tox test, uh, over four hours of lectures on mold and mycotoxin testing. There's a wide variety of breakout lectures in the toxicity mastery course as well. So um, that's all about toxicity. I have a 16 module autism mastery course. That's, that's really open to anybody. Parents can take that course, health professionals, I mean, Anybody can take our courses, but the content of these courses are designed for health professionals. So um, they're very comprehensive. Again, they're open act, they're open to anybody, but uh, I just let people know that the content is designed for health, uh, health professionals. And then we also have adrenal mastery and hormone mastery courses too. So you can get more information about those courses directly through Integrative Medicine Academy. And I'm always available for private consultations as well. Okay, so you can reach out um, for more information about private consults through my practice. The best email is scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. There's the phone number there, but uh, emails always work good. Um, I do in person, phone, internet consults as well. So I'm available for that type of thing as well. Okay, so if you do. Questions, the Great Plains will send those to me. Uh, usually come to me via email and I'll be able to answer back that way. Um, I appreciate everybody's attention. I hope this information was helpful for you. I know it's a lot of stuff, but uh, it's all, I think, all good. And I look forward to next month for another installment of Great Plains Labs complimentary monthly webinars. This is Dr. Kurt Wohler. Thanks so much. Take care.